Hi everyone, welcome to Church Online. This is Pastor John Dara. We're grateful to have you all here today with us. You know, we believe that community is really important here at the chapel, and we encourage you to be a part of our chat where you can ask questions, give prayer requests, or simply say hello. So we'll get started in just a few minutes, and I hope to see you there in the chat. Well, good morning and welcome to the classic service this morning online. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you've tuned in. And we just hope that uh, you participate with us in a great way this morning. This morning we're going to celebrate communion, among other things. And I thought it would be a really good thing if we took a few moments to just focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. So our worship this morning is going to be directed towards Jesus on the cross and what he has done for us. So let's worship together. Join us together when I survey the wondrous cross.
together. Father, we do pray that you would draw us nearer to you this morning. We pray that as we worship you, as we think about you, and as we thank you for what you have done for us, that we would sense your presence and that we would be drawn ever more to you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you comfort us. We thank you that you give us peace. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for what you have done through, for us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hi, everybody. My name is Jamie Longo, and I serve as the director of care here at the chapel. We want to welcome you, and we are just very thankful that you chose to join us this morning. I wanted to just take a few minutes to really express our gratitude to so many volunteers that have continued to serve, even though we haven't necessarily been on campus over the last few months. Uh, just a lot of ministry has been happening. Uh, our small groups continue to meet. Uh, men's groups, women's groups, even young adults ministries, all, all different ministries are still happening. Small groups are continuing because of faithful volunteers that continue to meet each week. And uh, a lot of relational connection, praying for one another, just kind of doing life together. So we're so thankful. Our, our prayer groups, our prayer teams are still praying. On Sunday mornings, each week, on Thursday nights, 
Each week, we have a, a faithful group of people that are committed to praying for um, all the prayer requests that come in throughout the week. They're praying for, uh, for you, our congregation. They're praying for the staff, for our country. They're just faithful, again, servants uh, that, are, that are covering all of us. So very thankful for that. Our care groups continue to care. We have um, groups like our addiction care ministry, More Than Conquerors. This is a, a group that these individuals walk al alongside those that are struggling with all kinds of addiction and um, just a really important ministry. Every Wednesday night, every Saturday morning, uh, they continue to meet online. A group like, like Life Givers. This is a ministry uh, for those that are suffering with life-threatening illnesses day in and day out. And we have a, a group of volunteers that meet, meets their needs through praying, reading the word together. Uh, so thankful for this ministry. Uh, Grief Share is another ministry uh, for those that are, are struggling through the loss of a loved one. There are people in this group that come alongside, they'll grieve alongside with you, but they also infuse the hope of Jesus. So we are thankful for so many ministries that are continuing to happen. We just wanted to take a minute to say thank you. And for those of you who may uh, know of someone or if you yourself want to get connected to some of these ministries along with others, please check out the chapel website uh, because you could find out more about them to get connected. So I'm going to pray uh, for our offering right now. And actually, it's another opportunity to humbly say thank you. You know, we recognize that this is a difficult time for, for many of us, for most of us. And so um, your generosity has been humbling um, we continue uh, to ask, give what you can, but we also know it's a difficult time. We on our side as, as the church, as leadership, will continue to lean into the Lord and, and to ask him how we need to spend out these resources um, that you have helped provide uh, for the kingdom and for his work. So let's pray now together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We, we give thanks for uh, the many people that you have raised up at the chapel, to be the hands and feet of Jesus to so many. We give thanks, Lord, for their faithfulness, for their willingness to continue to minister, especially over these last uh, few months. May you bless them, Lord. We just give thanks to them now. And Lord, um, as, we, as we offer our, our few loaves of bread and, and some fish, and we, we place our offering into the basket now, this morning. Lord, we pray that you would multiply what's been given and that you would help us and lead us, Lord, um, and to be faithful in the ways that, uh, that we use it to honor you, to glorify you, and to further your work here on earth as well as for your kingdom. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Samantha and welcome to the chapel. The wait is finally over. This week is our Chapel Kids Camp at Home edition and our Chapel Students Lockdown Games. If you haven't signed your kids up already, that's okay. There's still time to sign them up. If you are signed up, make sure to swing by the chapel today from 1 to 2 p.m. and pick up your CKC party pack. If you're not available to pick up during this time, simply email jasmine at thechapel.org. And remember, for our chapel students, there are certain days in which we'll be all coming together as a team. So make sure to sign up and get more information. If you've been wanting to reconnect with the Chapel family, then the wait is finally over because on July 19th, we will be gathering at the Lincoln Park campus for an outdoor night of worship. Seating is limited even though this is an outdoor event, so please head over to our events tab to register today. Worship will begin at 7.30 p.m. on the 19th, and we'll be live streaming this event for those of you who wanna stay at home. If you come and register beforehand, we ask that you arrive at 7 p.m. You can register today on our events tab. And here's another opportunity to connect with others. On Sunday, August 9th, we're planning a church-wide burger bash where groups can gather at people's homes for a barbecue and just spend time with one another. If you'd like to attend one of these Burger Bash events, just go to our website under events and sign up. 
Thanks for being with us today. If you have any more questions or want to find out more about our church, just check out our website. Good morning, Chapel family. Great to be with you guys today. Uh, You know, we are so excited about this week that's coming up. Um, Monday through Friday this week, we have uh, Chapel Kids Camp, the at-home edition, and so much work has been put into that. A lot of kids have been signed up for that, and so uh, we're excited for that that for this week. And then also our uh, impact games, which are called the lockdown games this year, partially online and partially in person. We think it's going to be a really exciting week. And then um, next Sunday, a week from today, our in-person live night of worship um, at the Lincoln Park campus. Uh, it's just going to be so great to see some of you that I haven't seen in months uh, to worship alongside of you. So looking forward to a great time uh, next Sunday night. We are taking the summer of 2020 to walk through the book of Proverbs, which is all about wisdom. And one of the times in life when we most need wisdom is when we face decisions. So we have to choose between A or B, the Honda or the Toyota. Well, that's not that important of a decision, right? But, but how about this, college A or college B? That's a little more significant. Or how about uh, surgeon A or surgeon B? The stakes keep getting higher, right? And so life is filled with decisions. Um, Some of them are really significant decisions, and it influences our life a great deal what we decide on those decisions. So this is a big part of life. So um, what I've noticed in a lot of decisions is it's not just A or B. Um, It's usually A or B, or maybe C, or D, or E, which is a combination of A or B, right? I mean, there's usually a lot of choices. So, I mean, isn't that a great thing that we actually have all those choices to make? Um, Not necessarily. I was just reading um, an interview with a psychotherapist who practices in San Francisco. Most of her clients are millennials, people in their 20s and 30s. And she said over the last five years, she has noticed this this trend in the reason that people are coming in for help. You know what it is? They have so many choices and they don't know what to decide. And they're terrified that they'll make the wrong choice. Have you ever felt that way? And now on top of all the choices we normally have, we have this whole new set of choices, right? Uh, Do you wear the mask or don't you wear the mask in the shower or when you go out? Uh, Do you take that vacation or don't you take that vacation? Uh, Do you fly or not fly? Is it not safe to do that yet? As a church, um, do we reopen live services or don't we reopen yet? And, you know, on both sides of every one of those, you're going to find people that have passionate views and are very vocal in their views. And and many times um, deciding not to decide is actually a decision in itself. So life is filled with decisions. Decisions have a huge impact on our lives, and Proverbs speaks directly to this. Before we look at the scripture today, I want to ask you to do something. Let's just make this really practical. I want you to bring to your mind a decision that you are currently facing. All right, so, so right now, something that you have to choose, maybe it has something to do with, um, with a relationship, maybe it's a financial decision, Maybe it's a a work-related decision, something that you have to choose and that you are wrestling with right now. You got that that thing in your mind? All right, I want to pray for you. Let's pray together. Our Father, we hold our decisions before you today, and I pray that as we open up your word, that your Holy Spirit will so light up our minds, Lord, that we will have the ability to choose wisely. We pray in the powerful name of Christ. Amen. All right, you ready? Let's look at today's scripture. Uh, We are going to use as our anchor passage today, very familiar scripture, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, submit to him, and he will direct your paths. This is the word of God. So, as we listen to what Proverbs teaches today about making decisions, um, here are the three points. Point one, trust in the Lord. Point number two, lean not on your own understanding. And point number three, he will direct your paths. So let's use Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as sort of the grid for, for hanging all the other concepts that we see in Proverbs, okay? Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding, and he will direct your paths. So first, trust in the Lord. As you face decisions, there is actually a decision that lies beneath all your other decisions, and that is the choice to trust the Lord. Because when we've made that decision, it changes the way that we approach all our other decisions. Your decision about what college to attend, your decision about whether or not to propose to your girlfriend, your decision about whether or not to speak out about some kind of social injustice, even your decision about whether or not to wear a mask. All of those decisions will look different if you've made the prior decision to trust in the Lord. So this is the decision that that influences all our other decisions. So let's ask a really obvious question. What does it mean to trust in the Lord? Well, it means that you have this view of God that not only does he exist, but he is personal and he is close and he is knowable. So you believe that God is right there with you. I love the way that the author Dallas Willard expressed this. He said that if you're walking with Christ, you're never actually alone. So he uses the example, if you are a plumber and you're down in someone's basement trying to figure out a complicated plumbing problem, it's never just you and the pipes. It's always you and Jesus and the pipes. So he's with you. He cares. He's in it. He's, he's got a stake in what you're doing. So it's never just you and the pipes. It's never just you and, and the clients. If you're a teacher, it's never just you and your students. If you're working from home, it's never just you and your laptop and your, your Zoom meeting. The living Christ is with you. Remind yourself of that often. Um, trust implicitly in him. Trusting the Lord also means that, that you realize and you believe that God really knows what's best. He's smarter than you. He knows more than you do. And so therefore, instead of making your life all about how can I get God to give me what I want, you become all about how can I align my life with what God wants. Romans 12.1 expresses this really well. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other words, it, this is not about inviting God to be part of our plans. It's about offering ourselves to be part of his plans. There's a, there is a sacrifice, a living sacrifice that you're making. Um, you, you're sacrificing your desires and your preferences to him. That's a big shift to make. That can be a scary shift to make. Francis Chan said it like this, Deep down, many of us want to control our own lives, and the thought of being led by the Spirit is unnerving and scary. So before we ask for the Holy Spirit, we need to release our grip of control on our lives. And guys, that's not a one-time thing. Like, oh yeah, I did that you know, when, I was, when I was 25. This is an everyday thing, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. Today, am I going to be all about my will, or today am I going to offer myself to do God's will. That's what it means to trust in the Lord. That's the decision that underlies all the other decisions that we're faced with. So how do you know if you're doing this? I mean, is, are there things that you can look for in your life that sort of give evidence that you're actually trusting in the Lord? Um, I think there are. Let me, let me mention two of them. First, when you have a decision to make, you pray about it like you mean it. I mean, you pray specifically and expectantly and intensely because you really believe that God cares about this decision. And then when you find yourself leaning in a certain direction, you invite God to step in and stop it if it's not the right decision. I can still remember when I was about to propose to my wife, Norma Jean, 
And so I, I, I had the ring, I was all set, and I specifically prayed, Lord, you know what I'm getting ready to do. You know I want to marry this girl. You know that I've got this ring. And yet before I, you know, kneel down before her, I, I kneel down before you. And Lord, if there's any reason you want to stop this, please do it. Please stop it. I mean, that, that can be a scary prayer, especially when it's something that you really want. Um, but it shows trust in the Lord. And thankfully, in that case, um, God didn't do anything to stop it. So when you're trusting in the Lord, prayer becomes a big part of making decisions. You pray like you mean it. Second thing, if you are trusting in the Lord, you're going to make some decisions that seem strange to people who don't know God. Hmm? You're going to do some things, some choices in life because of your trust in the Lord that, that seem just odd to people who don't know God. They won't get it. I was recently doing premarital counseling with, a, with an engaged couple, and they had decided not to live together until after the wedding. That's becoming a very culturally, um, countercultural thing to do. And they said, our friends don't get it. I mean, they say, they say to us, well, why wouldn't you just move in? I mean, it'd be financially better. We don't understand it. But they had made that decision because they're trusting in the Lord. When you are trusting in the Lord, you will make decisions about your money that seem strange to people. You might use your vacation time in ways that people don't understand. Why would you go there? Why would you do that? You might volunteer to serve in inner city ministries uh, in ways that might seem overly risky to some people. Why would, you, why would you put yourself at risk, at danger like that? I would even say this, that if every decision that you make seems completely normal to people who don't know God, then you're probably not actually trusting in the Lord. I mean, you should probably seem a little more weird than you do right now because of your trust in God. So step number one, the decision beneath all other decisions, it's more important than those actual decisions you make. It's the choice to trust in the Lord. Very personal thing, trust him. There was a, a famous author and, and philosopher named John Kavanaugh. And early in his career, he made, I believe it was a three month visit to Calcutta, India to visit Mother Teresa. While he was there, he was struggling with the decision of whether to stay in India and continue working with the poor or return to America and become a college professor. And so he asked Mother Teresa, would you pray for me that I will have clarity? And Mother Teresa said to him, no, I won't I'm not gonna pray for that. And he said, well, why not? And she said to him, because you don't need clarity. What you need most is trust. And he said to her, but it seems like you've always been so crystal clear on exactly what you're supposed to do. Mother Teresa laughed and she said, no, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I will pray that you will trust God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That is the decision that is beneath all other decisions. Here's the second thing. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. We are living in a culture that tells us, trust your instincts. Listen to your heart, right? Um, nobody can tell you what's right for you except for you. You do you. And the Bible basically says, nah, you're not that smart. <laughs> you're actually not that smart. So Proverbs warns us of two ways that we might be tempted to lean on our own understanding. So first, the danger of overconfidence. Overconfidence. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise, here it is, listen to advice. So a foolish person just goes ahead and does what they feel like doing. They, they, they do what their gut tells them. She got engaged because she was in love. It just felt right. Her friends were concerned. They saw warning signs in the relationship, especially this, this volatile temper of her fiance, which would erupt far too often. So a couple of her friends had the courage to talk to her and they shared their, their concerns. And she listened to them and she said, look, I appreciate your concern, but, but I know in my heart that this is right. I, I, I get it, he loses his temper sometimes, but it's because he's frustrated with his job. As soon as he finds another job, that'll get under control. So they got married. Uh, he did find a new job, um, but it wasn't fine. The marriage was a disaster, and it ended. 
Um, she now wishes that she had listened to her friend's advice. Um, wise people listen to advice. In fact, they don't just listen to it when it comes at them. They actually go out of their way to seek advice. Proverbs 15:22: plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So wise people actually gather advisors. They're humble enough to know, hey, there are people out there who know more than I do, who've experienced things I haven't experienced, who might be able to see blind spots that, that I can't see. That's why they're blind spots. So before they make a big decision, they seek a lot of advisors. You hear them saying things like, hey, let me bounce this off you. Hey, do you have 15 minutes? I'd love to get your opinion on, on something. Hey, tell me if I'm, if I'm missing something here. Last week in my men's group, I, I asked the guys in my group, how do you feel when somebody comes up to you and asks you for advice? You know what the guys told me? I feel respected. I, f- I feel honored. And then I reminded him, I reminded them, just remember, that's the way other people feel when you ask them for advice. It's not annoying. It's not inconvenient. I mean, I guess if you bug them five times a day for advice, that would be annoying. But when you ask somebody for advice, they will be honored and you might be a little bit smarter. So get in the habit of asking. You know who's a great example of this? And I I, I hope he's okay that I share this because I didn't ask his permission. Pastor Ted, our executive pastor, Ted Voltmer. Um, Over the past few months, the chapel has had some of the hardest most unusual decisions that we've ever faced. And as we walk through these hard decisions, here's what Ted says all the time, things like this. You know, I was just talking to Dave Brooks, the executive pastor over at Liquid. Here's how they're thinking about this. Oh, I was just on the phone with Steve Hawthorne from Emergence. Here's the perspective that they're taking on this. I was just um, conferencing with Tim Chicola from the Crossing Church in Livingston. Here's, Here's what they're thinking about as they make this decision. I mean, Ted is always reaching out, getting other people's viewpoints, listening to other people's perspective. It doesn't mean we necessarily do what uh, any particular other church is doing. So, you know, we, we, we ultimately make our, our, our own decision. But when we make a decision, man, we've done our homework. We, we very rarely have big blind spots. We know the options because we have an executive pastor who's wise enough to seek advice. And by the way, when you seek advice, the other nice thing is when the plan fails miserably, um, you have someone to blame. So there's that. So I'm joking about that. Some of us need to learn how to humble ourselves and listen to advice. Now, I realize that some of you have a very different challenge, kind of the opposite problem, because you're not too quick to make decisions. Um, Just the opposite. And so here's the warning for you. It's not the danger of overconfidence. It's the danger of overanalysis, overanalysis. And I'm going to cheat a little bit on this one because this concept is hinted at in Proverbs, but there's another place in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament where this is stated really memorably. So let's look in the book of Ecclesiastes, very next book of the Bible after Proverbs. It's, it was also compiled by, by King Solomon, we believe. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. So if you're a farmer and you're always analyzing the conditions, checking the weather report, checking them again five minutes later, examining the wind and the cloud formations, waiting for the perfect conditions to arrive, guess what? You will never go out and actually plant your seed because you're always procrastinating. There's always a reason why this is not the perfect time to do it. And because you never plant, you never get to reap a crop because there never was a crop planted. How does this apply to making decisions? Well, some of you are so analytical, so perfectionistic. Um, So when you have a decision to make, you research it, you seek out all kinds of advice, you lie in bed thinking through scenarios, right? I mean, you, you know who you are and you worry about it, and you just need a little more time, and so you become paralyzed by indecisiveness. And I think the Bible, I know the Bible is reminding us there's never a perfect decision. Uh, There's never a perfect time to do something. Sometimes you have to just choose. This has become one of my favorite bumper stickers. Ready? The road of life. 
is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. You've seen these, right? The squirrels on the road, I could go that side of the road, or I could go to this side, or that side, or this. That's not in the Bible, but it's, it's truth. I was on a mission trip a few years ago with my friend Alistair Bate, and in his teaching session, he told this story. He was on vacation, and he was out in a canoe with two of his daughters. So the lake that they, were, that they were on in the canoe had these two beautiful islands. And so there was one island over there, and there was one island over there. And so Alistair was sitting in the middle of the canoe, one of his daughters was in the front, and one was in the back. The one daughter, the one who was sitting in the front, wanted to go to this island. Um, the other daughter, the one sitting in the back, wanted to go to, to that island. And so both daughters started paddling toward the island that they wanted to go to. And he said, it was hilarious. The canoe started going in circles and then it started to rock and it almost capsized. And so finally, Alistair had to take control. And he, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're both good islands. I, I would, it would be great to go to that one or that one. But man, we got to just choose an island and go for it or we're never going to get to any island. So that was his story. And I don't know if anyone else appreciated it as much as I did when I heard it that way, because I, I, I needed to hear that. True confession, I can be overly analytical when it comes to making decisions. I can see both sides of an issue. That island is beautiful, but there's also some potential problems. That island is beautiful. There's also some potential problems over there. So I don't know which island I should move toward. We should do a little more research. So my point is, if I lean on my own understanding, the way that I'm wired, I can just keep putting off deciding. I can be paralyzed. So as I've come to learn that about myself, I've realized sometimes I have to push myself just to pick either one and just trust God with the results. Either, it's not like one island's the right one necessarily. Both could be good. Let's work together and get toward the one that we choose. Either one of the islands would be better than spinning around in the middle of the lake. So, first, trust in the Lord. How do you know if you're doing that? Um, you, you make decisions through a lot of prayer, and sometimes you make decisions that people who don't know God think are really strange. Secondly, lean not on your own understanding. And so some of us really have to watch out for, for the trap of overconfidence, right? Rushing into things. Some of us have to watch out for the trap of overanalysis. And then thirdly, final thing, it's the last phrase in Proverbs 3, verse 6, he will direct your paths. He will direct your paths. Some translations say, and he will make your paths straight. So here's what it's saying. Even though you are the one who is making decisions and choosing options, ultimately, the process is being guided, sometimes mysteriously, by God. Proverbs 16, 9 says it like this. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. In other words, nothing wrong with making plans. In fact, you got to make plans, but just remember you're not God <laughs> and your plans might not go exactly as you thought they were. And therefore, Proverbs 27.1, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not even know what a day may bring. So as you make decisions and plans, um, stay humble about it. Hold your plans loosely. We say that a lot lately. <laughs> Don't be shocked if God has something in store for you that's different than, than what you thought would happen. I've shared with you before that when I started college, I had decided what I was going to do with my life. I was a, a human nutrition major. I had a chemistry minor, and I was fully planning on becoming a highly successful MD nutritionist. So that was my, my vision. Uh, my freshman year, I joined a student club on the campus for pre-med students. I studied really hard. So my first year, I would say I sort of tolerated chemistry. And I didn't really enjoy it, but I got A's and B's. I got to my second year of college, and now I had to take this class called organic chemistry. It's hard for me to describe to you um, how much I did not enjoy that class. Um, I would say that when I was doing organic chemistry, it was confusing and frustrating and boring all at the same time. So by the way, college students, if, if something you're studying is confusing and frustrating and boring, it might be a sign that's not the right thing for you to do with your life. 
So that's how I felt about organic, organic chemistry. And I realized I was headed for a really bad grade. So internally, there, there started to form this, this dissonance, this, this tension. So on the one hand, I really wanted to be a doctor. That was my dream. On the other hand, I was realizing I didn't even really like doctory kind of classes at all. Um, and at the same time, God was getting a hold of my life. I was beginning to fall in love with Jesus and, and with the Bible. So about halfway through my second year, I realized, you know, that plan of being a doctor might not be the right plan. And I'll be honest, th there was a painful thought to give up that dream. And I, I didn't know what that meant. For a while, I thought, okay, I should be a, a counselor. I could, I could help a lot of people. Then I thought, well, no, maybe I love languages, so maybe I'll translate the Bible into remote languages. It was a very uncertain time. I felt very much not in control. But here's the point. Through all of that, God was actually directing my paths. Through my fumbling and my uncertainty, God was still God was still sovereign. He was still working, and he was guiding my path where he wanted me ultimately to go. So maybe for, for you, maybe, maybe you're kind of like me, that for years maybe you had a certain dream about where you thought your life would go. Now you're beginning to question that, but you're having a hard time letting go of that dream. God is working even through that. Um, trust him. He's in control. He's directing you. Or maybe you've made some really bad decisions. Maybe, maybe, you know, sinfully bad or maybe just stupid bad decisions. And maybe you're experiencing some of the consequences of those bad decisions. God is working through that. He's directing your paths, even through your stupidity. I mean, isn't that comforting that God's, God's even big enough to work through our really bad decisions? So pray a lot, gather advice and counsel from people trust in the Lord, and make the best decisions you can. But at the end of the day, don't trust in your great decisions. Trust in the Lord. Thomas Merton was a monk who lived during the 20th century. And I don't hold to everything that he taught, but he had some really good insights into spiritual life. And he wrote this prayer that became known as the Merton Prayer. And I think it's a great way to end today's message before we move into communion. So here, here's the prayer. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, and here's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your paths. Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for communion. So we're gonna pause for about a minute in case you need to gather the, the juice or wine and the, and the bread. Um, we'll see you about in about a minute to receive communion together. I think I must have said it 
10 times during the message that there is a decision that kind of lies beneath all our other decisions. Um, and if you don't know what that decision is, then you definitely have not been listening. Um, you've been too distracted at home. But what is the decision that underlies all our other decisions? The decision to trust in the Lord. Um, to believe that he is with you, that he's good, that he cares about you, and that he has your best in mind. So when we make that decision to really trust in the Lord, it influences all the other decisions we make. But let me ask a really important question. Why should I? Why should I trust in the Lord? I mean, doesn't God sometimes not answer my prayers the way I think he should? Um, doesn't God sometimes allow me to, to go through painful things? Why, I mean, why, why should I trust him? Well, here's why. And this is the most important thing you're going to hear this whole day. Because of the cross. The reason that we can even do what Proverbs tells us to do, to trust the Lord with all your heart, um, is because of the cross. Because at the cross, at, when Jesus made the decision to go to the cross, he was choosing to do something huge for your benefit. He was choosing to, to go through the, the physical pain, and he was choosing to go through the, the spiritual agony of the cross so that you could be forgiven and so that you could be connected with God, your creator, for eternity. So, yes, sometimes God does not answer our prayers the way we think he should. Sometimes God allows us to go through painful things. But at the end of the day, it is well with your soul because of the cross of Christ. That's why God is worth trusting. And so, if you are wrestling with a decision, as you make that decision, make sure you remember the cross. If you're thinking about a decision and, and it involves maybe doing something sacrificial or difficult for the benefit of another person, and you're not so sure you should do that, remember the cross. If you're thinking about making a decision that will seem odd to other people who don't know God, will make you look a little strange to them, remember the cross. The reason that we can trust the Lord and lean on him and know that that will be good is because of the cross of Christ. Remember the cross. And so today, we're going to remember the cross together by receiving communion. So in a moment, you're going to be hopefully holding in your hand a little piece of bread. Jesus said about that bread, this is my body. You're going to be holding in your, your hand a cup of, of juice or wine. Jesus said about that, this is my blood. And so when you feel those, those elements, the body and blood of Christ, enter into your body, would you allow your trust to go deeper and stronger than it's ever been before? Allow communion today to build your trust in the Lord, which influences every decision you're going to make. So let's just take a moment and thank God for what we're about to do. Father, today we pray that as we once again consider the cross, as we once again receive the body and the blood of Christ, that you will help us to understand the depth of your love for us so that we will trust you more fully with all that we are. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Jesus was gathered with his disciples in the upper room, it says that he took bread and after looking up and giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, let's take the bread together. It says at that same gathering, Jesus took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of this cup as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, let's take the cup together. And as you receive the body and the blood of Christ today through the bread and the cup, remember what it symbolizes. Remember his personal love for you and allow your trust in him 
to grow deeper and stronger. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your paths. Amen. As we close the service today, would you join me in a closing prayer? Our Father, as we face decisions in our lives, I pray that by your grace and by your Holy Spirit in us, that we will trust you with all of our heart, that we will be a little bit suspicious of our own understanding and not trust ourselves. I pray, Lord, that in all our ways, we will acknowledge and submit to you. And that, Lord, you, because of your love for us, will direct our paths. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. If you need prayer or if you want to connect further, I'll be hanging out in the chat. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a great week.